there is a state of war that exists between much of the intangible world and the tangible world. We hope you agree that there's no expiry date on hearing the gospel and that clear biblical teaching is timeless. Be still my soul, the waves and winds still know. This is Living Truth. We live in a world that is more connected than ever before. We have at our fingertips the ability to communicate with people across the globe in an instant. At any hour of the day, we're one click away from creating or sharing information worldwide. As Christ followers, we have been commissioned to share the gospel with all nations. Living Truth is on the air 52 weeks of the year, endeavoring to use media to do just that. For decades, Living Truth has followed God's lead in sharing resources to grow in faith. We are gospel-centered and globally engaged. Through platforms like television, radio, and digital media, we have the ability to transcend borders and translate languages to deliver God-breathed scripture beyond all sorts of barriers. Living Truth produces clear biblical teaching that allows people to experience Christ in their own homes, across the street, across our nation, and around the world. For some who are unable to attend a local church, Living Truth is their church community. God is using this ministry to reach the masses. Summertime is a financially critical season for us, and we depend on viewers like you for continued financial support. In a ministry of this scope, there are ever-present production costs. We're halfway through the year, and we rely entirely on viewer support to top up our ongoing creative costs and keep us on sound financial footing. We're reaching out to loyal supporters like you to ask you to help us reach our goal of $250,000 for our production fund. To help support our production costs, send a check to the address on your screen. To donate with a credit card, call toll-free 1-888-269-6085. You can also make a secure donation by visiting us online. Living Truth is a registered charity and all donations are tax deductible. We invite you to join us, of course to continue to gather with us, but also to engage the world with the good news by financially supporting Living Truth. Your prayers and financial support are critical for our ministry. We can't do this without you. Thank you for your faithful partnership. We wish you and yours a wonderful summer. God bless you. During the next few weeks, we're revisiting messages selected from previously aired series. We hope you agree that there's no expiry date on hearing the gospel and that clear biblical teaching is timeless. Join us this summer as we rebroadcast some of our most sought after messages. This is Living Truth. If you have a Bible with you, I'm going to read some verses from Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 10. Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you'll be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything, to stand. But I want to talk to you about who's who in the cosmos. You see, there's more going on in this world than we can see with our eyes or hear with our ears or even smell with our noses or taste with our tongues or feel with our hands. There's more than the tangible world that is going on. There is an invisible world, the Bible tells us, which is just as real as the visible world and we need to take it into account every bit as much as we take into account the visible world that we see and hear and feel and touch 
every day. That's the language of the verses that we read together in Ephesians 6. Not only that, but that indicates that there is a state of war that exists between much of the intangible world and the tangible world. That's why Paul writes, uh, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against authorities, against powers of this dark world, against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms, spiritual realms. And there is a world which consists of angels and of demons. There's a world which consists of God, but also of Satan. There's a world which consists of good, but alongside that, there is evil in our world. And enemy number one is the devil, Satan. He's known by different names. Now I want to talk to you about the devil tonight, about Satan. But what Scripture tells us about him? You know, one of the big philosophical questions in the world surrounds the existence of evil in a world that God created as good. You remember God's verdict on his creation was it was good, very good. And yet there is the existence of evil, there's the existence of pain, there's the existence of suffering. And evil is a very obvious present reality in the world in all kinds of ways. So who is the devil? Is he a negative image of God, a negative mirror image of God? There's God one side, the devil the other. We know God is slightly strong. He's going to beat him, but there's this kind of dualistic view of the world, these two forces fighting it out. Is that how we should understand it? Is the devil simply a hypothesis to explain evil? We personify the reality of evil in the world by saying, well, there's a person called Satan, but it's really... A hypothesis is not real. And the Bible leaves us in little doubt that it intends us to understand the devil is a literal being. He is mentioned in 26 books in the Bible, seven of the Old Testament books, 19 of the New Testament books. Jesus referred to him on 15 occasions, plus on many other occasions. He spoke about demons and evil spirits, as does other parts of Scripture as well. But you know, there are many who don't believe in a literal devil. I talk about many Christians who don't believe in a literal devil. Well, the Bible speaks about him as a person who acts, who thinks, who makes decisions, who is independent of any other force in terms of what he does. But I want to talk, first of all, about his origin. If Satan exists, where does he come from? Let me go back to the first question. If God is such a good God, and he created everything well, and created everything with the verdict it was good, how is it that evil does come into existence? That's a huge question. I won't answer it tonight, of course, but I want to just answer one aspect. How does a good God become responsible for creating an evil devil? And the answer is an interesting one. The answer is this. God did not create an evil devil. What he did create was a beautiful angel. An angel who surpassed the beauty of every other aspect of his creation. He was called the morning star, which literally translated in Hebrew means Lucifer. Morning star meaning the most beautiful star in the sky, the, most, the brightest star in the sky. Let me read you two passages in the Old Testament Scripture that we recognize are a revelation of the origins of Satan. First of all, in Ezekiel chapter 28, verse 11, the word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, take up a lament concerning the king of Tyre and say to him, this is what the sovereign Lord says. You were the model of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. 
You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone adorned you. And he lists a whole catalog of these precious stones. Your settings and mountings were made of gold on the day you were created. They were prepared. You were anointed as a guardian cherub, for so I ordained you. You were on the holy mount of God. You walked amongst the fiery stones. You were blameless in all your ways from the day you were created until wickedness was found in you. And through your widespread trade, you were filled with violence and you sinned. So I drove you in disgrace from the mount of God. I expelled you, O guardian cherub, from among the fiery stones. Your heart became proud on account of your beauty, and you corrupted your wisdom because of your splendor. So I threw you to the earth. I made a spectacle of you before kings. Do you know, some years ago, I was talking to a, a group about 200 teenagers and I read some of these verses to them, and I said to them, I want you to tell me who you think these verses are describing. And I was selective in the verses I read to them. I read these verses. You are the model of perfection. You are full of wisdom, perfect in beauty. You are on the holy mount of God. You walked amongst the fiery stones. You are blameless in all of your ways. I said, who do you think I was talking about? One of the kids put his hand up and said, Solomon. Well, probably because it says you were, you were full of wisdom. I said, that's, that's an interesting one. That's a good one. Anybody else? Somebody said, David. Anybody else? Somebody put his hand up and said, Jesus. I said, let me pause at that moment. There are three options we've been given there. Solomon, David, Jesus. Who do you think it is? Is it one of these men? You're the model of perfection, perfect in wisdom, perfect in beauty, blameless in all your ways. I said, put your hand up if you think it was Solomon. About 20 put their hands up. Put your hand up if you think it was David. And about three put their hands up. I said, put your hand up if you think it's Jesus. And about 150 hands went up. They said, this sounds like Jesus. The model of perfection. I said, I'm going to surprise you. This is describing the devil. When God created him in perfection and beauty, but he says, your heart became proud, so I threw you to the earth. Earth is where Satan lives. Not hell. He will one day move on. But right now, he lives on earth. That's where he operates. That's his origin. The second thing I want to talk about is his personality, because Satan has a personality. He's not just an evil force, as I mentioned earlier, that some have suggested, and many seemingly born-again Christians are prone to believe he's just an evil force in the world. No, he's a, he's a person. Actually, we're told that he has physical form. There's no record of that physical form being seen by human eyes or by physical eyes. But 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 39 to 40, says, all flesh is not the same. Men have one kind of flesh, animals have another, birds another, and fish another. There are also heavenly bodies, and there are earthly bodies. The splendor of the heavenly bodies is one kind. The splendor of the earthly bodies is another. Now there are heavenly bodies. Now if Satan was created as an angel, the greatest of all the angels, we know that there have been times in history and times in Scripture when angels have made physical appearances. There's actually no record of demons making physical appearances. Demons possess people and express themselves through somebody else's body and personality. Angels never do that. But there is record of angels appearing in physical form. And we can assume from this that the devil has a physical form. But when I speak of him, his personality, I'm thinking more of the fact that he has a mind, he has emotions, he has a will. These are the three components of personality. The ability to think, the ability to feel, and the ability to choose. 
We're told he has a mind, he has intelligence. Second Corinthians 11, verse 3 says, I'm afraid that just as Eve was deceived by the serpent's cunning, your minds may also be led astray from your sincere and pure devotion to Christ. Now he talks there about the serpent's cunning. The serpent is another name for the devil as he appeared in that form. And if you have the devil appearing in any physical form in Scripture, it is as the serpent, but he thinks, he has a mind, he's cunning. He also possesses emotions. We've already seen that pride was the motivation that drove him in his rebellion against God. But we're also told he has anger. Revelation chapter 12, verse 12 says, Rejoice, you heavens, and you who dwell in them, but woe to the earth and the sea, because the devil has gone down to you. He is filled with fury, because he knows his time is short. Filled with fury. Now, interestingly, there are negative emotions attributed to Satan, pride and fury. There are no positive emotions ever attributed to Satan. Love, joy, peace, these are not emotions that are ever part of his experience. Now, in his state of being rejected out of heaven, instead he is consumed with negative emotions of anger and fury and pride, jealousy, destruction. But he also possesses a will. And I want to read you what Paul wrote to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 24, where he talked about the Lord's servant, speaking about Timothy there, who was leading the church in Ephesus. The Lord's servant must not quarrel. Instead, he must be kind to everyone. He must be able to teach, not resentful. And those who oppose him, because that's part of life, those who oppose him, he must gently instruct in the hope that God will grant them repentance leading them to a knowledge of the truth and that they will come to their senses, listen to this, and escape the trap of the devil who has taken them captive to do his will. Now Paul says to Timothy, you're going to find those who will oppose you in Ephesus as you seek to lead the church of God there. They will oppose you. You'll find this, he says. But you deal with them gently and trust that God will give them repentance, will bring them to the knowledge of the truth, because otherwise their senses are being trapped by the devil who has taken them captive to do his will, because the devil has a will. Jesus said to Simon Peter, just before Jesus was arrested, he said, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you like wheat. There's some interesting things there we'll talk about another time, that Satan needs permission. He's asked to sift you like wheat. And don't forget that when you think of what happened later that same day when Peter, or early in the following morning, Peter denied Jesus three times and cursed and swore and lied, ended up in tears. Don't forget that Jesus said, Satan has asked to sift you like wheat. And presumably... Permission had been given. And the devil had attacked him because he has a will. We are protected. The devil does need permission. We are told no temptation has taken you that is not common to man, but God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you're able to bear, but with the temptation will provide a way of escape that you might be able to endure it. That God does allow us to be tempted. Now, if that's Satan's origin and his personality, thirdly, his location. Now, he was originally in heaven. We've already seen that as one of the angels of God. But he was cast to earth. Ezekiel 28, 17 says, I threw you to the earth. Isaiah 14, 12 says, you've been cast down to the earth. Jesus, in Luke 10, verse 18, when he addressed the 72 who returned, surprised that demons submitted to them in his name. Jesus said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. I saw him driven out. Revelation chapter 12, verse 3, talks about the dragon 
which is a description of Satan, one of the other pictures of him. Let me just read these verses to you, actually. Uh, Revelation chapter 12 and verse 3 and 4. It says, Then another sign appeared in heaven, an enormous red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns on his heads. His tail swept the third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to the earth. We'll talk about that probably next week, uh, what that implies. But he talks about them curling th these uh, stars to the earth. Actually, it's probably the origin of demons. Stars is a word used to describe angels. And when the devil rebelled, a third of the angels joined him in his rebellion. It would seem to be what it indicates. But verse 9 says, The great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. And this is the place where he operates. This is the place where he works. This is the place where he lives. Now he gets hauled back into heaven once in a while, by the way. We know that from some insight in the book of Job. And we only know what we, can, what we discover in Job chapter 1 because God must have revealed it because it tells us that God in heaven called his angels before him. One day, Job 1 verse 6 says, One day the angels came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came with them. The Lord said to Satan, Where have you come from? Satan answered the Lord from roaming throughout the earth and going back and forth in it, because that's what he does. He roams throughout the earth, but once in a while it seems God grabs hold of him by the scruff of his neck and hauls him up to heaven, sits him down, and says, Hey, how are you getting on? Then he picked on Job. How are you going with Job? Hey, there's nobody like Job. He's righteous, he fears God, he shuns evil. And Satan said, yes, but the reason why you ask me about Job is because you know everything has gone well for Job. You built a hedge around Job. I can't get at him, you've made life so good for him because he's rich and prosperous and he has a lovely family. And God said, all right, we'll take the hedge down, but these are the limitations. You can touch his possessions, you can even touch his children, but you can't touch his body. And don't touch his life. There's some interesting insights just from that one event. One is that Satan is accountable to God. And God sets the boundaries around Satan, and God can change those boundaries whenever he chooses to. Satan, you can attack Job. And you remember how Satan attacked Job. Job knew nothing about it, but he suddenly one day found that his livestock had all been killed and stolen and taken away. And then his children all were killed when a, when a hurricane hit the house where they're having a party. They were all, all dead. And then in chapter 2, Satan's hauled back to heaven again. How are you getting on with Job? Well, you knew and you said I could touch everything but his body. The man's so selfish. And as long as he doesn't feel any physical pain, he couldn't care about his kids and everything else. And God said, all right, you can touch his body. See, God changes the boundary again. Okay, you can touch his body. Don't take his life. And Job got sores from the top of his head to the soles of his feet. He found nowhere comfortable, went and sat in the ash heap and scratched himself with broken pottery. And at least the ash heap was sterile. Then his wife turned nasty and said, curse God and die. And you probably know the rest of that story. How that God took him through this experience. When I say God took him through, God permitted it. It was Satan who did the attacking on him, but with God's permission. And Satan, although he is on earth, and although, as we're going to see another occasion, he is prince of this world. We're told the whole world is in the power of the evil one. I hear Christians say that God is sovereign across the world. The Bible tells me the devil has power over the world. Now, God is ultimately sovereign, of course. But there are things that are going on which are not the will of God in our world. You can be sure of that. They're the devil's work. But he gets hauled up to heaven, sat down before God, interrogated. We're told in Revelation 12, the accuser of our brothers accuses them before God day and night. He has access to God. Well, he accuses us before God. We spoke, Ephesians 6, of that term, spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. He operates in the heavenly realms. Now, don't get the idea that God and Satan are two equal forces. One is bad, one is good. Maybe God is slightly stronger. They are totally different. Satan is not the antithesis of God. 
Very important we understand that. You see, God had no beginning. Satan was created. We don't know when he was created. We don't know when the angels were created. But he was created. Ezekiel 28 says that. In the day you were created. God is omnipresent. He's in all places all the time. Satan is not. He is local. He goes to and fro across the earth. But God gives the devil enough access to break you. And when you're broken, that's the time. God begins to rebuild you. You don't be scared when the devil is attacking. It'll be opportunity to grow. This summer, we'll bring you more messages from previously broadcast series. Revisiting these inspiring messages reminds us that whatever changes come about, God's Word was, is, and will forever be the only unchanging reality. Join us next time for more clear biblical teaching here on Living Truth. Our program is recorded at the People's Church in Toronto, Canada. If you live in the GTA or plan on visiting, please join us and experience God's Word. We'd love to meet you. To watch this message again, visit our website. Download transcripts, order DVDs and CDs, as well as our daily devotional, or sign up for our monthly newsletter. Online, you can sign up for podcasts. You can also join us on Facebook, and YouTube. Join us next week for more clear biblical teaching and the continuation of our summer programming. This is Living Truth. Wow.